morning and welcome to this important session which we are about to commence, uh, developing a new generation of technocrats. Um, I'm not the person who has been listed in the brochure um, to moderating because uh, one Mohammed Fridos, who was supposed to uh, moderate the session, unfortunately has been called to an urgent um, emergency, um, and therefore sadly he could not be with us. But I hope that the, I'll be able to lead the session in the way that he would have done in much more dynamic fashion. Um, our three distinguished speakers who we have with us uh, today, their profiles are listed in the brochure. Very detailed um, information is available. Uh, we are delighted that they are with us this morning and participate in this very important session, um, bearing in mind the, the flavor of the the young dynamism that I see um, uh, on the floor uh, are here, and I'm sure it's going to be very, very interesting. So without taking much more time, uh, let me briefly introduce to you the three panelists we have uh, this morning. On my right, um, we have Oslem Elantorlu from Turkey, uh, a former parliamentarian um, um, who's a present board member of Pentel International, which is part of Turk Telecom Group. Um, she will, of course, be dealing with the subject, giving more attention to the area of technocrats and the new wave of governance and public policy making. On her right, we have Aaron Maniam. Uh, he's from Singapore, and he's the director for the Institute of Policy Development. Uh, in the Civil Service College. <clears throat> Again, Aaron has got a vast experience in terms of research um, and the work that is related to this field, which inshallah he'll be able to expound in a very um, a dynamic way. And on my far right, um, someone who, of course, I'm quite familiar with, know her, well as well, know her as well, Zushara Ali, our, um, one of the youngest members in Parliament in Britain, um, she was elected the last um, election, playing a key role. And I'm um, aware at the moment uh, she does some of the ministerial duty, duties, supporting from international development to other areas as well. And um, Ushna represents the important district area in London, uh, Bethnal Green and Bath. So could I start off with um, um, Oslem? Let me, if I can give the floor to you. Each of the speakers will be <clears throat> speaking for about five minutes or so. There'll be um, an inter exchange amongst the speakers for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then, of course, we'll be going to the floor, seeking your views if there are any questions that you wish to put forward. And that will be the area which I think will hopefully bring in a bit more liveliness in the discussion that we are going to have today. So please pass on to you now. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I know it's not really right to start with saying I too much in any kind of presentation, but I should say that um, I started my career as a district governor uh, at the age of 22. And I spent almost 10 years in public sector. And why I'm telling you this, this is that uh, there's, n to assure you that there's no single or any miracle explanation of uh, what good governance is all about. And, and, uh, and today, that's why I'll try to uh, address s some of the issues concerning how technocracy and democracy uh, compatible and comply each other uh, for achieving better governance. As all you know that good governance uh, depends on good administration, and if we define what is good administration, uh, we can say that which fairly and effect efficiently achieves public goals, thereby promotes public welfare, and it follows that good administration is an absolutely necessary <coughs> condition of maintaining social harmony. But the cru crucial question is, what is public goal? And how we can actually promote public welfare. 
These are the questions that have greatly exercised governments in the West in recent years. And the broad political consensus that formed around a certain set of answers to its later part of the 20th century had far-reaching consequences. As a serious, uh, wide-ranging governmental reforms were integrated that aimed deliberately at replacing an old model of administration. This new model, sometimes called new public management, held out the, that the promise that public administration was not only uh, democratically accountable, uh, but also improve the quality and efficiency of technical administration. There is no doubt that many improvements uh, occurred. The reformers uh, actually tried to fulfill two imperatives. Uh, one, uh, for greater democratic accountability on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, greater technical proficiency in ways that proved incompatible and contradictory. It was accepted that a good administration was one in which managers had the discretion to decide on the best and most efficient way to deliver services. And it taught, uh, it was also demanded that administrators become more directly responsive through consultation and various parts between methods to clients, state, uh, stakeholders, and the general public. But the distribution of discretionary freedoms throughout the service, combined with the demand for greater public responsiveness, meant that many more civil servants were now explicitly involved in policy matters than ever before. This is an inherently political as opposed to purely administrative matters. Of course, we should not underestimate the real achievements of the technocratic authority in the West. Most of the improvements made in health, sanitation, and the provision of utilities like fresh water can be laid out of the doors of local authorities who allied with uh, health professionals and engineers, believe that they knew better than the people, they knew better what was good for the people than did the people themselves. So indeed, these achievements had the effect of making the technocratic dream seem realizable. The basic assumption of technocrats is that because of the realm of policy is messy, divisive, and fundamentally irrational, it obstructs obviously good or necessary solutions to the social problems. However, technocratic management cannot deal with certain basic questions that are irreducibly polit politics, political. For example, if we accept that experts in education, medicine, economics, and so on are themselves politically neutral, how are their disciplines to be ranked overall? Who is to decide and how and what the priorities are to be within and between each discipline? How is a problem to be defined in the first place? These and many other questions do not admit of merely technical answers. And moreover, a particular field of expertise may be, in a sense, morally neutral in that it can be argued better or worse only in its own technical terms. But it, as soon as it tries to transcend these terms to judge larger issues of social and political uh, priorities, it immediately enters the political realm and is no longer speaking in a purely disciplinary manner. So one promising modern suggestion for coping with this problem is to establish deliberate democratic procedures that involve the wide range of citizens in decision-making process. New public management attempts to replace strict obedience to rules and the commands of superiors within the new qualities, including flexibility, innovation, entrepreneurialism, capacity for independent and discretionary judgment, uh, ethical competence, policy awareness, sensitivity to political factors, abilities to manage and lead rather than administer. And under the new order, 
Managers were given discretion to choose where and from whom to purchase services and how to, restru how to restructure and improve the services they themselves provided. At the same time, traditional lines of accountability were blurred, complicated by a loosened hierarchical structure, and by demands that public servants take more control of budgets, be more directly responsive, to the public, have a better grasp of their role in policy processes, and practice routine identification of policy stakeholders in order to conduct extensive internal and external consultation. Managers at all levels were to be left free to manage, to be risk-taking, entrepreneurial innovators who would find new, better, and cheaper ways to do old things. As a last word, in the public sector, prudence surely implies a special sensitivity to the constraints imposed by a unique political administrative environment. The prudent public sector leader is in fact unlikely to be the visionary, boldly going type, but rather the discreet and pragmatic kind whose leadership may be scarcely noticed by he or she influences. Despite, and in democracy, a prudent manager will know how and when to enlist public democratic sensibilities, or at least how to avoid offending them. Prudent public managers will be those who are capable of acting and leading efficiently without endangering their own legitimacy. They will rely on technology without succumbing to its temptation. They will exercise prudence and good judgment for the public good and in doing so promote and secure harmonious society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Oslim, for the wonderful um, insight in terms of the, the role of the civil servants um, who, need to be, who need to be much more involved in the policy matters, and of course, reference to being responsive to the issues that are being felt in the community as well. Um, it's now my pleasure to invite Aaron Maniam from Singapore, again, a person who has been in the civil service uh, for some years, um, to please um, uh, take the five minutes now. Thank you very much, Sir Iqbal. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for this very kind introduction. The organization I come from in Singapore is called the Civil Service College. And so our aim really is to train and build capabilities amongst our individual public officers, as well as teams of public officers, in the skills we think they will need for the future. And of course, to be able to do that, we have to have some idea what exactly that future might look like. And today what I wanted to do was to share with you just three ideas about what that future might be, and then three consequences that have fed into the kind of nurturing and training that we do for technocrats and bureaucrats of the future. The three ideas are essentially this, that the 20th century was in a lot of ways a century of big ideas. We saw ideas of democracy come to fruition, uh, big ideas like communism and, and fascism were also a key part of what defined many of the big events in that century. And if you think about it, I think the three things that will define the 21st century are big data, small gadgets, and people in the street. <clears throat> Let me tell you a bit more about what I mean by each of those things. Big data, small gadgets, and people in the street. Big data really refers to the fact that with the enablement of the internet and the growth now of more measurable, quantified um, variables, we ha now have greater capability to measure things at greater speed, greater scope, and greater scale. Individuals can measure their lives down to things like how much their heartbeat varies over a day. Governments like Singapore's can measure how road usage varies within a day. We can look at how to visualize data like that. And when that sort of thing happens, I think there is a wealth of information that becomes increasingly available to inform policy making not just the guesswork um, of policymakers, but informed and specific data that we can use to make decisions about where exactly we want to deploy transport policy, how we want to have healthcare, 
um, take place in different homes, and how the measurable data that comes out of that can actually result in richer policy making. Now, these things are, of course, enabled by the kinds of small gadgets that we increasingly are able to use. Small gadgets like our phones, like the tablets that many of us are carrying around, all of which connect us and allow us to not just measure data, but actually cross-compare and, and do both intertemporal and interspatial comparisons across these different variables. And I think once you're able to do that, the effects on the third idea, the man in the street, become very, very profound. Because when information is available to this extent, and when it is available in such an easily accessible way through small gadgets, what we essentially see, I think, is a disintermediation and an increasing democratization of information. And I think, Oslam, you alluded to this in, in your remarks already. The fact is, information is now available to more people much faster than it was before. And I think citizens today are interested in being involved in the process of policy making, not just being told what policies have been decided for them by some kind of higher authority. And what we have, therefore, is not just consultation of citizens becoming more necessary, but actually collaboration with them to introduce new policies. And in Singapore, we're going through a process now that's called the Singapore Conversation, where policymakers, politicians, citizens of all kinds are coming together to co-create, co-construct, and co-invent what they think the future might look like. Now, of course, we can't consult on everything. I think on areas like tax policy, on areas like finance, on areas like security, there is still an incumbency upon governments to make certain decisions. But that doesn't mean that there cannot be consultation about a whole host of other things. The consequences of this, I think, are the fact that networks now become much more important and that governments, where they used to be primarily regulators and entities that ensured the efficiency in resource use, are now becoming much more wide in their roles. Governments are now aggregators of people and ideas. Governments convene groups because they may not have all the answers, but the groups may have a wisdom of certain crowds in them. And governments therefore facilitate rather than tell in a didactic way what policy needs to be. What this means, I think, is that power will increasingly have to be shared in diffused networks and not just exercised in a one-directional way by government entities. So these are just some thoughts to provoke um, questions, I hope, uh, for later. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for the wonderful articulation. And again, emphasize um, the use of the gadgets that can be much more useful in, an, in transmitting information in both receiving and getting the information out across as well. Um, my, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Rushnar Ali, uh, who I mentioned earlier, uh, is a member of parliament in the UK. Um, as with um, Ozem, she again had the experience of being in the, um, involved with the civil service. So we have that real benefit of knowledge in terms of our role in the civil service, um, how we're able to get the information across. Um, and then when it comes to being a politician in parliament, um, you know, it gives a good reflection as to what is required on the other side as well. So without much ado, um, pass on to Rushnara. Thank you very much, and Salaam Alaikum. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say what a pleasure it is for me to be back in Malaysia. Uh, I was here two years ago, uh, and uh, as before, uh, the sense of excitement about this region is, uh, is phenomenal, uh, particularly in Europe, where we face uh, very little economic growth. So we can uh, only um, admire, but, uh, admire the progress, uh, particularly on the economic dimension that's being made here, and the exciting innovations that are going on here in this country. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the... Uh, World Islamic Economic Forum and the Young Leaders Network for inviting me here today. I want to focus on three key areas. The role of technology in politics. You'd expect me to do that, being a politician. Uh, the second is around the relationship or the new relationship that is emerging uh, between the citizen and the state uh, or government and therefore the bureaucracy or technocracy or technocrats, uh, if we are get to go with the terms used here. Uh, and the third is around 
how institutions, public and pri private institutions, not just government institutions, but how these institutions respond to a new kind of way in which uh, technology is changing our lives uh, and changing our expectations of what we want from politics, uh, from our power holders, uh, decision makers uh, in the traditional sense, uh, uh, our private and public institutions, and where the citizen fits. The citizen that's armed with new technology, new media, uh, uh, as uh, my fellow speaker has just mentioned, uh, the um, way in which technology is so fast moving and so fast, uh, so reactive and requires more immediate responsiveness from power holders. How do we harness that for new opportunities in order to generate positive social and economic change and societal change? And what are the, what are the, some, some of the challenges and threats? So first of all, if we, if we just look at some of the major changes and the effects of technology, I want to cite two, uh, two or three uh, areas in particular. The first is, if you take Africa, there has now been over 3,000% growth in internet usage in the last 10 years, with over 167 million people across Africa now using the internet, compared with 4.5 million just over a decade ago. That is unparalleled, and that has enormous potential for development, both social and economic development. This is especially interesting given Africa's population is overwhelmingly young. The average age in Nigeria is just under, eight, uh, is just under uh, 18 years, and in Ethiopia, just under 17, compared to 40 in the UK, for instance. So that acceleration of access to technology is having profound effects and will have profound effects across regions around the world. Um, in 2010 alone, the number of mobile phone users in a country like Rwanda grew by 50%. Um, and as we've recently seen in relation to the Arab Spring, uh, there was a significant influence of how people organized and mobilized using new forms of technology. It wasn't the panacea, but it was an important tool in helping people to gather, to share information, to buck the attempt of uh, an authoritarian governments to try and repress them. So uh, in order to have the... Uh, use then the traditional methods of coming together in gatherings and uh, campaigning and challenging governments. What does that signify? It signifies the normal potential for citizens to organize themselves and to find routes to challenging governments in the more extreme cases as we've seen overthrow them. Uh, but it also signifies that if institutions and politicians are not responsive to the expectations of the citizens, the threat to uh, the desire for change can manifest itself in ways that might not be ones that people uh, wish to see, uh, but at the same time could be positive. Now, these are obviously sensitive issues, but why am I raising the issue of the Arab Spring? Because it shows that citizens uh, can mobilize in a way that they haven't been able to in the past. And they can organize using new media and technology that provides enormous potential and opportunity, but also challenges. Uh, in, in relation to the impact on developing countries, the potential for innovation and development is huge if it is channeled in the appropriate way. So if we take the way in which smallholder farmers get access to 
uh, the way that uh, the, 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 the information that they require in order to plan their work and to prevent risks, that is likely to uh, enable them to produce in a way uh, that is going to be more effective than was the case in the past. So access to information channeled in the appropriate way uh, to ordinary people in uh, developing countries as much as anywhere else uh, can be phenomenal. Uh, organizations and NGOs working with citizens in those countries have already started to use technology to try and help them to deliver on the ground. In terms of uh, disasters and emergencies and humanitarian challenges, again, the role of technology is critical. The way in which, for instance, in Pakistan, during the, uh, after, in the aftermath of the floods, that uh, aid was distributed, demonstrated that there was huge potential for uh, using technology in order to ensure that support got to the people who needed it most and uh, to reduce the risk of uh, that aid going into the wrong hands or being misused by corrupt officials, for instance. Similarly, in countries, in other developing countries, the role of technology is increasingly critical to making sure that there's proper monitoring of where aid assistance is going. Uh, so we can make sure that our resources are more effectively used uh, in order to ensure there's better accountability. Uh, I'm giving you the development country examples uh, as one, uh, you know, a, a, to illustrate this point. But it's relevant to any society where access to information uh, to the citizen helps to increase accountability. In the UK, we now have more scrutiny about how, how public money is used. So any expenditure by the local government uh, of over a, a certain amount of money has to be put online so that citizens can see where that money is going to. All of these are important attempts by, uh, by uh, in political institutions as well as local government to try and ensure that the citizen can see where money is being spent. <clears throat> but another dimension is around how citizens can also initiate change. And one way of doing that is to look at how they can directly influence the way politics works. Uh, in, again, just to give you a couple of examples, in the UK, uh, one of the ways in which uh, people have tried to do that is through e using e-petitions. Uh, we now have a system where if 100,000 people sign petitions, then uh, they can uh, force uh, Parliament to consider having a debate on that issue, and that can lead to legislative, uh, that can lead to votes that require, can lead to change in the future and put an issue on the government's agenda. And there have been a number of recent examples of that. Uh, this week, where we've had a major inquiry in the role of the media led by uh, Lord Leveson, this is what's happening where thousands of people have signed a petition to uh, ensure that the government debates this issue and changes uh, the current practices through introducing uh, legislation. Uh, and there have been many exa other examples where citizen power through the use of technology uh, has led to policy change by the government, has forced the government to make U-turns, to change their policies, ranging from schools, uh, sports policies to forests, would you believe, changing uh, the government's policy on how forests are managed in the UK to uh, uh, fuel duties, uh, a major success on those sorts of issues. So there have been some exceptional examples of how technology plays a massive role in enabling government and politicians to think about how they do business uh, and change their policies. But I believe that it's not going far enough. 
And one of the areas where there's a need for significant reform is within the bureaucracy, within how civil servants then respond to that kind of pressure. And in the advanced uh, developed countries that have had established bureaucracies for a long time, they require radical reform and modernization. In newer democracies, they rec I believe that one of the key ways to ensure that technology and citizens for, for, form uh, are central to decision making is to ensure that uh, institutions are more responsive to what the public want and need, uh, and that that is truly integral to how policy is shaped and made. Thank you. And Rishana. that's what I hope that this debate will generate. Many, many thanks, uh, Rishana. I know this is um, quite an important subject where the, the time allocated to the um, uh, panelists is, 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 is really insufficient. But however, we got the gist of the message in terms of some of the practical um, issues which Rishnara highlighted, whether it's the, the Arab Spring, the role of technology in terms of bringing about the change, whether it's aid in disaster that uh, takes place in different parts of the world, how technology can be helpful. And of course, in our daily lives, in terms of the issues that the country faces, the government in obtaining the views, the community on any major issue that comes in. Um, before we um, uh, take the opportunity to hear any comments and questions from the floor, uh, one area which has not been touched, and if I may ask the, um, the panelists to literally a minute or two, to briefly comment on the future of multilateral institutions. We have, the, of course, the OIC, IDB, um, many other international institutions that are there. Um, what sort of effect it has on them and the benefit? So, please. We'll come, come, uh, thank you for the question. Um, be before we go to these kinds of in institutions, maybe it's, it's better to actually start with how actually democracy will be in the future. So that, that would be maybe a, a, a better question, because we're now uh, facing with... The reason, sorry, the reason is that we, these institutions are already in place. Yes. They are yes. playing a key role. Yeah, the course. chain that is coming out, yeah. um, how do we see them being more effective? Yeah. Uh, will they be much more used, or do we strengthen their role uh, uh, in, in both in, in local, um, mm -hmm. national, and international areas as well? Mm -hmm. uh, the philosophy of democracy within, within the future, but maybe in the long term, that will change, maybe come back to the ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't even know, don't know, even we do have in the future, we will have governments at all. For example, uh, with the improvement of this technology, maybe uh, we'll, we'll go back to the di direct democracy without rep having representatives, without having any kind of politicians. Now we're just imagining this. We're just you know, thinking maybe now, for well, those of you, it's like an, oh, it's just a friction thing. But uh, with this past innovations in technological areas, I believe that everybody can have its own ID number, can easily log into the internet or to any kind of PC and just vote for for the debates or any kind of legislation. Sure. So, if we think about in the new in the future that the governments will uh, change or evolve into something different, I cannot imagine about how multi electric uh, organizations will be. I mean, you've hit the very central point of where the initial concept of, in the community is yeah, there, and yeah. then it can take further. Aaron, what do you what's your views on that? Um, I don't know if this is the answer you expected, sorry, Iqbal, but. Um, <laughs> My thought on this is what we're really asking here is are multilateral institutions capable of innovating right? beyond the nation-state-based systems that they primarily operate on now? And I'm reminded a bit of the work of the, the sociologist Everett Rogers, you know, who says that with any innovative process, there will always be innovators, early adopters, an early majority, a late majority, and then laggards, the people who you know, don't switch phones until they are absolutely forced to because the spare parts are no longer in, 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 on sale. Um, and I suspect that that kind of process is going to be similar even in multilateral institutions, just as we see them in national institutions. Within governments, within organizations, there are going to be particularly innovative sections that do 
really interesting, forward-looking work, and that are going to be spearheading the I government type work. And I think we see examples of you know, this in, even in places like the UN, where civil society organizations or citizen groups have been invited to some of the more recently formed talks, like the ones on climate change. Now, whether they have an effect yet, that, that's much more open to question, but they are at least being involved in the process. Similarly, in any large organization, there will be the early, late majority and laggard types as well. Parts of those institutions that are much more resistant to change, perhaps because a lot of their current operating procedures have been predicated on the assumptions of nation states and their centrality in the system. So I think there will be a whole range of, uh, and a whole spectrum of uh, Very change. Thanks. That's great. Ishmael, what's your view? Well, I think the big challenge for, uh, for multilateral institutions is to respond to three things. The fact is that because they're big, uh, they're multinational, uh, the pace of change is, uh, takes a lot longer. And yet citizens increasingly expect things to be responded to much faster. So if you take, for instance, the European Union and how it's tried to arrive at decisions about uh, the economic crisis and the slow compared to what is needed by markets, not just citizens, markets want speed, speedy responses to the economic crisis. Citizens want accountability and they want to know how their money, what, why the bailouts are required and how it's going to be spent. They're quite different in terms of the consensus process that's required within the European Union. And so you have different expectations pulling in quite often contradictory directions. And that requires reform of multilateral institutions uh, in order to be able to respond to the kinds of pressures that are now uh, coming, but also to be able to keep up with the pace of change of the 21st century by institutions that were often developed in the 20th century. Uh, and that is, that is the big, big challenge for, for us. Um, quickly, Aslam, and then I want to basically go to the floor. Most of the institutions are actually uh, built after the Freedom Wood Agreement. Most of the institutions now we're facing is actually built after the Freedom Wood Agreement. And uh, they generally, the, the way they actually, uh, uh, the way their decision-making processes actually deals with the Western societies and the nation states. Yeah. But we're now facing with the change of the world and the power from West to East and Asia today. And we can see that there's a kind of deficiency about the justice and the fairness of this decision-making processes. Now, I believe that these institutions should and somehow need to reform themselves immediately to meet the actually requirements from Asia, from Eastern society. Good. Many thanks. Well, we now come to the, the, the most interesting part of the, the session, and that is the interaction with the, with the members on the, on the floor. WIF is, you know, um, is, is aimed to bring about greater participation through the interaction in these sort of sessions. Um, so what we will do is, uh, there are mics around, um, please um, uh, raise your hand if you wish to uh, give any questions, but we have to be very, very brief so that we get the <coughs> maximum participation, uh, and therefore uh, we do not need any speeches. I would appreciate if a great opportunity should be given to our younger members of the audience, because they have, of course, the, our elders and our mature members have had the uh, role in, in participation in other sessions, um, and, and then the yeah. panelists will be able to uh, briefly comment or answer to your questions. I'll be taking two to three questions at a time. Um, there's a sister up here. Yes, in the front, in the... In the, in the ladies second. first? Yes, or please. The no, the ladies, ladies. first on, on that. On that. That's the, the first one. Then we've got a young gentleman here, uh, right. the number two. And the third person, we have what? In, in, the, um, in the stripe, ready yeah, shirt. I'm a student from International Islamic University in Malaysia. I have a question to Roshana Ali, which was compressive, the, your opinions about technology. As the students, and we are always curious about political issues, political uh, policy making. As a European Union, you know, how is it concerned? I want to know, what are you talking about the radical reform you're talking about? Sorry, say, say that the again. radical reform. Would you be more clear about what sort of radical reforms? Because as I know, according to the system for the past five years we've been analyzing, it's almost 
the, even the technologies there, the use are coming up. I mean, the problems that we're addressing. But the thing is that uh, we find the government is sort of preparing for it as a defense mechanism. It's not a solution to the issue, even in the Arab world, in, even in Syria, what is happening. It's more like it's not about, we, they know what citizen wants, but it's more like a government is preparing as a uh, defending themselves to make them feel safe or sort of thing. So what is your response to this kind of radical reform, yeah, in your opinion? Thank is you. it more, judge, uh, I mean, more justice and sort of thing? Fine. Okay, we'll make a note of it. Can we have the second uh, question, please? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Mahat Abuddin. I'm from Bangladesh. I have uh, one question. Actually, two questions. Uh, in the entire 19th century, the economic uh, scenario, the size of the economy, uh, and today, the size of one tech-based company is bigger than the entire 19th century. The total transactions took place in the entire 19th century. And if you think about the food requirement and the water requirement. It's a question. Or yes, it's a question. It's yeah. a question. So the question is that uh, the technology-based, uh, technology-driven companies are getting, uh, you know, bigger and bigger than the asset-based company, what we have seen in the previous industrial revolutions after the place in industrial right. revolutions. And now, if you think about the food security of the people you, you are talking about, the water security you are talking about, uh, do they have any long-term plan? Because uh, almost all over the country, uh, world, the politicians are facing a today's crisis, not tomorrow's crisis. So what they're doing for the tomorrows, right. the young leaders we have okay. here, so that's can they have any? All the three panelists can answer. And then the final question comes from a uh, gentleman. It's, uh, excuse me, pass on this, uh, the mic to the gentleman here. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Omar. I'm from uh, International Islamic University, Malaysia. I think my question is addressed more to Roshanara Ali. What are the key success factors for effective implementation of, of uh, electronic government? I mean, the system where all the services are delivered through the internet. I, I mean, the public services. That's my question. Thank you. Thank so you we've got much. two questions for Roshanara, and then the third question can be answered by three panelists. Roshanara? Okay, so on the, on the first question about radical reform and, uh, you know, is it justice uh, and so on, I think obviously each of these cases uh, are going to be different. And uh, it's between, um, I cited the examples because they highlight uh, the way in which dialogue or conflict is being expressed in societies uh, and the role of technology in that. Now, it means that, that uh, the use of that tool is increasingly central uh, in many, uh, many countries. Uh, the question of how these issues get resolved is, of course, between, uh, within, often within the nation state, uh, although, as we've seen uh, in the case of uh, Places like Libya, there's been external need for external uh, involvement. But essentially, uh, this is a forum and a route by which citizens are demanding much more from their political leaders and their institutions. And it's not just specific to public institutions. You see that in the private sector as well. The requirement for more responsible capitalism uh, which is happening a, a lot in debates around the world, including in my country. Uh, and to campaigns such as the need for prevention of tax avoidance by big national, multinationals that are taking resources away uh, from many billions of pounds away from the public purse. On the question of um, effective, what does effective, if I understood it correctly, effective e-government look like? It will look different in different places. But in the UK, for instance, one of the things that uh, is increasingly proving to be uh, uh, helpful, uh, and I think, I believe there are many very good, better examples out here as well, uh, is, for instance, how public services give feedback uh, on, uh, to the citizen uh, on uh, how things are being done. Uh, because if you are a victim of crime, for instance, you want to know what happened when you make a complaint. 
whether the person who's the perpetrator has been caught. Uh, and the trust in those institutions would be strengthened if you can establish better feedback mechanisms. And also co-production, uh, this point about how you develop policy with citizens rather than to them is absolutely critical to how that's done. In, you know, there's a bigger debate. Very, it's a very big question how you make e-government more effective, but it has the potential to generate more efficiencies, more savings, and we've seen that in many countries and many examples. Uh, and I, I think, you know, uh, I'd be very interested in hearing later on uh, some of those about those examples out here as well. Okay, um, Oslin and uh, Aaron, thank you, sir. You'd like to comment on the last question? Okay, Aaron, you'd like to... Okay, to um, just some quick thoughts. First of all, on you know, the, the nature of current crises and whether or not we're dealing with them versus tomorrow's problems. I think that the ability to, to conduct what some people would call futures thinking and considering these, these long-range problems is quite critical. And you're quite right that very often we end up dealing so much with the fires of today that we don't think enough about the, the problems of tomorrow. There, there are governments that are trying to do more on this, uh, and, and Singapore is one of them, but there are others as well. You know, the Dutch do a lot of good work on long-range crisis uh, and trend analysis. The Finns do a lot of good work as well. The UK has a very strong foresight capability and the idea behind all of this is not to identify every single possibility and then plan for it, because the world is too surprising for that, right? It's much more varied, much more complex than any of us can ever imagine. But what we can do is at least plan for some of the more um, imaginable possibilities. And in preparing and rehearsing options for those, we find that actually we are preparing for a much wider range of crises. Many airports, for instance, found that after you know, major volcanic crisis, uh, eruptions, the plans that they had to respond to terrorist attacks were very similar to what they needed to do even when there was a giant ash cloud that forced their airport to close down. So in preparing for one single set of crises that we try and imagine collectively, we actually end up being able to prepare for a much wider range of, of issues. And technology actually helps us to do this even better because instead of just having five people sit around a table and brainstorm about what problems they're anticipating, you, with the ability to crowdsource, we can actually have a much wider, richer, and more diverse set of perspectives. Just one quick thought on Omar's question as well about the key success factors for e-government. Um, I agree totally with what Roshanara said. I would also add that I think it depends on whether you're trying to address technical or complex problems. Technical problems which have fairly simple and efficient solutions. In those cases, e-government, I think, needs to almost eliminate service. The less service it provides, the better. So you know, citizens should be able to have one-stop shops they go in, they key in the things that they need, whether it's renewing of passports or paying their taxes, and then they're done. You know, it should take five, six minutes and be done with a process that doesn't become too much of a burden. But where e-government can become much more useful is where it's used to tackle complex problems, things that don't have simple solutions and where even the definition of the problem is very wide and varied. And in those cases, I think what e-government helps us to do is to reach out across a much wider range of people and achieve the collaborative outcomes that I think a few of us have already talked about. Thank you. Right, let's take a few more questions to the floor. Um, so the next sort of three, now I'll pass it on since you have raised early on. So gentlemen here, there's a gentleman there in the second row, if you could please give the mics to them. And there's someone at the back, a so hand um, coming on. Okay, <laughs> then we'll have the third gentleman here. My name is Abdul Karim. I'm a retired civil servant from Bangladesh, so I'm in the senior group, uh, not the junior group. And I had the privilege of um, meeting MP Mrs. Uh, Roshanara Ali about two years back in the Prime Minister's residence. And uh, my question is uh, uh, quite straight. During uh, my long service in the government, I have seen that the resource-constrained countries, the developing and the least developed, like Bangladesh, uh, we find it extremely difficult to extend internet services to the rural areas, to the vast majority of the citizens. Then how do you expect these countries uh, to have effective uh, delivery system I government uh, deli service delivery <coughs> system in those countries. What is the solution? Thank you. Thank you. 
That's fine. Um, gentlemen here, <coughs> second row. Assalamu alaikum. My Salam. name is Awolu Namadina from Nigeria. My question is, uh, in an atmosphere of uh, e-government, how do you safeguard data and uh, shield the whole process from manipulation? Thank you. Thank you for this very succinct question. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. K Sheriff, Dr. Kamal Sheriff. Uh, my question is mainly addressed to this panel for their valued opinion, especially to Mr. Manin, who trains bureaucrats. And I, well, what do you think is the best relationship between the new generation technocrats and the bureaucrats? Because the uh, technocrats feel there's a lot of interference from the bureaucrats. So the technocrats feel, I'm a medical administrator, you would call me a medical technocrat, because uh, the technocrats feel they should be given a free hand to implement the policies. But then uh, the bureaucrats have their own views. So uh, the non-technical people head the uh, technical departments. What's your view, please? Thank you. We were three very brief um, uh, questions, and it would be nice to have a clear succinct answers to three of them. So who will start on today? Azam, you like to go on? One is on the, of course, on the issue of extending. Um, I would like to have a comment yep. on the last, last question. question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, your question is, I, I, thank you very much for the question. Really, really, it's very beneficial. And Mike, okay. you bring it closer. Okay. okay. Thank you for your question. And, and in my career life, I mean, I've been in, in, a, in a bureaucratic positions and later on worked as an expert on public procurement and later involved in politics so, and become, became a member of parliament. So I've been in three different stages and levels in the public policy, I should say. And in each of them, I had similar uh, feelings about the other level. For example, when I was a district <coughs> governor, I thought that I'm the one here forever. Politicians come there, stay there, stay there for now, and gone tomorrow. <laughs> so that was my feeling at the age of, at the beginnings of 20s, really. But when I actually entered to the parliament, my whole understanding was totally changed. No, that's not the case. That's not the reality. That's not the fact that you should a broader, you, should, you need a broader perspective <coughs> actually to solve the problems. So that's why in my presentation, I tried to just combine that even though it seems that technocracy versus democracy, in a, in a good governance, we need some kind of mixture of them. Uh, so, but how it is, I mean, these different parts of the public policy will sometimes fight each other, sometimes uh, will have some kind of compromise, but find a way at the end. Thank you. Well, I mean, um, um, Aaron, you're not politician as yet, but uh, quite a bit no, of vast yeah. experience in different... I'm a civil servant in, in a Westminster system, so you know, we serve the government of the day. Uh, but I, I do have some thoughts, on, particularly on the second and third question. Um, first of all, on this idea of you know, the, the tension between uh, new generations and, and, and existing generations, or what you characterize as technocrats versus bureaucrats, I think a lot actually hinges on how we approach the idea of tension. Is tension and constructive conflict of ideas necessarily a bad thing? Um, and a lot of what I think big data and small gadgets teach us is all of us actually have cognitive biases. We view the world in certain ways, we have certain mental models, certain myths that underpin everything that we think. And actually, everyone has those, whether you are a technocrat of a new generation or a bureaucrat of an existing generation. And I think the key is for as much mutual respect to exist between those different groups, because very often, technocrats who have a big idea for a grand change, find from talking to their more experienced colleagues that they may not undermine the change, but they could actually find ways to refine their ideas and find ways to sell them better and communicate them better. Similarly, if there is 
I think the effort put in to have the deliberative discussion between both groups, sometimes existing bureaucrats find that the new ideas actually can be quite useful. Now, in all of this, leadership is also very key. And my institute at the college actually teaches people who we expect to move into positions of senior leadership quite fast. And we often tell them that their job is to actually broker between these different groups and make sure that the different worldviews never necessarily dominate the other. What's really important is to make sure that there is almost a constructive tension between these groups because that's when you know that there is going to be maximum learning rather than complacency coming about simply because one group is favoured over another. Um, on the idea of manipulation of data, I think that's really quite key and the more there is, the less control governments are necessarily able to, to exert. I do think one key thing is that where possible data should be anonymised so that it cannot be used for abuses of privacy. And really if what you're thinking about doing is aggregating the flows of people across the city in terms of transport systems, or if you're looking at what kind of preferences they have for overall healthcare systems, then you may not need specific demographic data in terms of identities, apart from you know, maybe basic information like the age group or the gender of, of a particular person. So I do think anonymization is helpful. Apart from that, I do think that there is a significant amount we, where we will have to realize, rely on the wisdom of crowds to actually debate with each other and have marketplaces of ideas where genuinely bad or pernicious ideas are found to be such in, through a debate and through a discussion such that they then don't survive the, the overall um, rigour of that, that debating process. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I want, I'll pick up on the question from Mr. Karim about countries that, how can, how can governments uh, in developing countries spread uh, the effects of spread, spread the use of mobile phones and other technology. And I, I mean, I, I think you're being have, showing a rather dim view of Bangladesh in a way, because there are some great examples. Obviously, it hasn't spread as far as possible. But this is a country that has been incredibly resourceful in using uh, uh, new methods, not very uh, dramatic forms of technology, but uh, cyclones, for instance, are a great example where in a country like Bangladesh, people get on their bicycles and they blow a whistle. They're using two pieces of, the, these, this is not new technology, but they're being very resourceful in using material to be able to save lives. They're using phones. Uh, there are cheaper forms of telephone technology uh, by uh, organizations like Grameen, Bank, uh, Grameen Phones and many others. But you're right that there are resource constraints, but there are huge opportunities. But I think this is an important debate for international development uh, uh, organizations and governments when they uh, fund, uh, provide funding on how technology can be accelerated in countries if there are gains to be made in reducing poverty. And I believe that this is, this is an important area uh, to, to pursue uh, and to look at how that can be supported. The work of Mo Ibrahim Foundation, for instance, is an interesting, you know, that, that's another interesting example, the work that uh, the Bill Gates Foundation is doing and so on. So there are many good examples, but I agree with you that there are, of course, resource constraints and pressures. Uh, in relation to the point, the, the, I, I didn't catch, apologies, I didn't catch the question about Nigeria, but, but maybe we can come on to that if necessary. If, if possible later. But the question of the technocrats versus bureaucrats, uh, like Oslam, uh, Oslam, I was also a bureaucrat for a period, but I found it incredibly frustrating because it was very, um, I, I was in the British Home Office and Foreign Affairs, Home and Foreign Affairs Ministry. But they, the, one, of the, one of the challenges was that it felt quite uh, stultifying uh, and I think one of the questions is how do you get systemic innovation that in, enables the uh, non-government organizations, the campaign organizations, and citizens' input to be genuinely engaged in the decision-making process so that you can get better policy-making. And there's a lot of talk about that, but not enough action. And, that, and I think central to that is the question of the extent to which those who currently hold power, whether they are bureaucrats or technocrats, the older generation or the newer generation, how much they're willing to share that. And that, the P word is really important here 
Because until people in any country are prepared to open up and look at where they can share and co-create, uh, where they can develop new solutions to old problems, but also big emerging problems, then we're going to be stuck. And the bureaucracy, um, uh, the, the, the systems of government that is expected to deliver more and faster and more rapidly is going to find itself stuck if it doesn't reform uh, and change in order to respond to those expectations. And I hope, and I, I'd like to see, uh, certainly in my country, um, a, t a time when the younger generation see the civil service as a place they can genuinely go into in order to change the world, in order to make their lives and societies better. And that has got to be the ultimate test of whether uh, technology and the role of technocrats and bureaucrats uh, lead to such change in the system of government that people do feel that that is uh, the critical way in which you can make change happen and improve your societies. Thank you. Well, I think with this positive note um, of optimism as to what we would like to see in the future, the role of the, um, the young people joining the civil service um, with the aim of trying to deal with the deficiencies and the lacunas, um, that's something which I think will be very useful and hopefully the technology will be a great um, uh, medium to, to bring that change. But with all good things coming to an end, we are now conclude this important session. But before we do so, I think it's appropriate to express our appreciation to the wonderful um, explanation which our panelists share with us, the experiences, and if we can show our appreciation to them as well. Thanks to all the uh, members who participated in the, in the forum, um, uh, in the question and answers, and I'm sure the, we will now be going into the next forum. And see you then. Thank you. Thank you once again to our panel of speakers as well as our moderator. Could I kindly ask all of you to get together for a bit, uh, group picture? In the meantime, we will make preparation to move on into the third session for today, the dialogue series, Are Policies in the Muslim World Hindering the Spirit of Entrepreneurship? <laughs>